Hello, class. I heard you missed me. I'm back. Welcome back to Sports Ethics and Social Justice in Sport. I think you know by now this is our fourth week that I'm Professor Robert Romano, and I think you know who you are. Uh, today we're going to talk about the ethics of drug drug use and drug testing in sport. And interestingly, you know, this is one of the most debated ethical dilemmas in sport because there's always, you know, why can't I do put in my body what I want to put in as long as, you know, it's not hurting anybody else or you know, with the other side, is it cheating or getting an unfair advantage, right? This issue is not new in sport. The issue of uh, drug use or performance enhancers has been around as the other uh, PowerPoint that I put up this week um, indicated. It has been around since the ancient Olympic Games. We have doped from the beginning. Um, if you're an athlete, you're trying to get advantage on other athletes, you want to win. So, you know, the purpose of drug, drug testing is basically to prevent the use of artificial drugs by competitors, right? We want to make sure that everyone is on the same playing field, right? Ensure that competition is as fair as possible to all participants. So that's why you know we, we ban specific drug use. We want to make sure that you know the players are tested to make sure that everybody's uh, on the same playing field. No one has an unfair advantage. You know, athletes' um, argument though sometimes is why they engage in in the use of performance enhancement drugs is because you know. Their, prof uh, their profession depends on winning, right? Their profession depends on winning at the highest level. You know, think about Lance Armstrong. You know, his performance, his way he made money was winning the Tour de France. I mean, that was it. So to engage in practices that may, may be unethical or possibly illegal, well, what am I supposed to do? This is, this is how I make my livelihood, right? So, um, their careers are short for the most part. An athlete's career, you know, typically, you know, two, two to five years at the most. You know, the average NFL athlete's life expectancy is three years. Um, it's not a long time. So they want to capitalize on that short, short career to make as much money as possible. And if they need enhancers to get them there, well, who are you to tell me no? Uh you know, the argument being the better they perform on the on the field, the more they're going to earn off the field, right, through their player in contract or endorsement. You know, you're playing for your next contract. So if you do extremely well and you perform extremely well on the court, on the field, on the pitch, whatever it is, that next contract is going to be very valuable. So, so why should I be barred from it? You know, the question becomes, though, and this is the interesting thing um, ethically is, what constitutes a performance enhancement drug? You know, how are recreational drugs performance enhancers? For the most part, no. So then why are they banned? You know, are, is coffee a performance enhancer? Oh, I have a cup of coffee right now. It's not enhancing this performance at all. Um, but it's considered a perform. Caffeine is considered a performance enhancer. So there is no exact clear definition of what a performance enhancement you know, or enhancing drug is, right? It varies from sport and level of competition. So, you know, what the NFL may say is a, is, a, is a banned substance or performance enhancing drug that is banned may be okay in basketball or maybe be okay in international soccer or maybe okay in badminton, but it's not in archery. So what constitutes an important performance enhancing drug varies by sport and varies by level of competition, amateur, professional, international, all that stuff, each of which has its own definition and list of banned substances, right? So you may, you know, it's interesting in, in, in cycling, you know, the, the whole EPO thing, you know, that for the most part wasn't banned for the longest time, right? So how is it a performance enhancement if it's not a banned substance? If you keep your EPO levels at a certain thing, then you're really not violating the rules and it's not a banned substance. So, you know, are we really engaging in um, performance enhancement that is illegal? It may be unethical, but is it illegal? So these are things I just want you to think about. Um, most of the time, performance enhancement drugs come in different forms, right? It could be a diuretic, could be a sedative, painkiller, stimulant or something that helps build lean um, muscle, 
All right, so it could be a number of different things. So if you ever looked at a banned substance list, it's pretty, pretty intense, it's pretty inclusive of bands with different forms of diuretics, different forms of sedatives, different forms of painkillers. Um, you know, I know the Roger Clemens and the Roger Clemens indictment, they said that he was getting some form of painkiller and it was over the counter. Um, stimulants and uh, drugs that build lean muscle, lean muscle. All right. So the question becomes, if the governing body doesn't have a distinct definition of what performance and answers are, then how do athletes know, know how to not engage in such practices? Well, they need to. I mean, even though it's different in the different uh, levels and it's different within each sport, you have to look to your own sport, okay, and find out how they define performance enhancement drugs and what their banned substances are, okay? You can't, you don't, you're never going to have the argument, well, football does it, I can do it, or if um, it's okay in basketball, you know, it's okay in baseball. No, you have to stick to within what your sport is, all right? So what level you are and what sport you're in, and then look to your banned substance list, okay? And this is where it gets interesting. You think, we, you know, um... NBA basketball players competing in the Olympics, right? What may not be banned in the NBA may be a banned substance in international um, basketball. So they, you really need to think about this ahead of time. So if you're going to go play for the, the national team in the Olympics or overseas, uh, an international competition, you know, you, you have to abide by your rules as an NBA player, and you have to also abide by the international WADA code, the international governing bodies code, okay? So something interesting to think about. Um, interesting thing, if you use, are you just breaking the rules or are you cheating? You know, if you use performance enhancers, is that just breaking the rules or is it cheating? Is it unethical? Or does it go above an eth ethical? Well, what if it isn't a violation of the rules, but you're getting an enhancement? Is that cheating? Right? Different thing, ways to look at this. Um, should, and the other question you may want to ask yourself, or think about at least, is should athletes be allowed to use, use a performance enhancer, enhancer if they fully understand and accept the consequences? You know, we all the time assume risk as adults. You know, uh, NFL players assume the risk of concussions, which may lead to uh, long-term uh, problems, Alzheimer's, dementia, all that stuff. But they choose that risk, right? They, uh, they assume that risk. Well, if they're assuming that risk, why can't they assume the risk that are associated with um, performance, enhancers, uh, performance enhancers? You know, there may be a negative side effect to you know, human growth hormone. Okay, but I'm an adult and I want to assume it. Okay, just something to think about. Um, if they're not physically harming anyone but themselves, why do we care? You know, why do I care? You know, somebody walking down the street smoking, I mean, that's hurting themselves, but it, why do I care if they're smoking? You know, if an athlete is uh, engaging in, or using PA performance enhancers, well, why do I care? Well, why do we care about this so much as fans, as sports executives? Why do we give so much attention to it? Um, may, is it because the use of prof, uh, professionals using performance enhancers it influences our younger athletes and we don't want that? I don't know, maybe. Um, is there too much pressure then? Is, the, is it not dead the fact that, you know, the athletes are doing it so the younger athletes want to emulate them so they're going to use performance enhancers? Or is it flipped? Are we putting too much pressure on our young athletes? Right? Are we putting so much pressure on them to get that college scholarship that they engage in the use of PEDs? You know, is it looking to, to the, are we looking to the, the professionals to guide us or is it our own pressures to make it to that next level? But is this the real issue? Does the use of PEDs alienate the fans? And maybe that is the issue. You know, maybe it's the fans' reaction to performance enhancers or how we manipulate fans and believing PEDs are wrong. And maybe that's the crux. I mean, um, maybe it's not the fact that we give, really care if the athlete's putting this into their body. Maybe it's not really, you know, the fact that um, it's going to influence younger players. Maybe the real issue is fans want to see everybody on a playing field. 
or other athletes want to make sure that everybody's on the same playing field. All right, because there was a period of time where the leagues didn't care, and the athlete, the fans didn't care. Right, the baseball steroid era, right? Early 1988 to the early 2000s, right? So that'll probably be a question on the on the quiz. Baseball steroid era. Right during this period of time, you know, McGuire and, and Sosa were hitting home runs like it was unbelievable. Right, it was like boom, boom, boom. Everybody's hitting home runs, and this helped the MLB because in 1994, 1995, there was a work stoppage. There was a labor dispute. Uh, there was no baseball for 230 plus days. We didn't have baseball. We didn't have a World Series that, that year, right? So the fans kind of were oh, okay. Well, they're going to ignore us. We're going to ignore them. So it was a difficult time, you know, post 1995 to bring the fans back. Well, McGuire and Sosa hitting home runs uh, all every day kind of brought the fans back. So it kind of worked, right? Oh, this is exciting. People want to see home runs. So. Um, Let's 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 ignore the fact that they may be juicing. You know what I mean? Yeah, let's put, this is working for us as a business. So you know, during a period of time where it was helping MLB, they kind of turned their back on this PED use, right? It was bringing fans back to the park. So well, why do we care? All right. Um, and then came the Mitchell report. Right when it got to a certain point where maybe it was getting out of hand, the Mitchell report came into. Um, into being. And if you guys aren't familiar with the Mitchell Report, I posted it on Blackboard or on Canvas. Um, it's a long document. Just brief yourselves on it. Get, get, get familiar with it. The Mitchell Report came, came out in March 2006. And what it was was Senator Mitchell uh, was requested to investigate allegations that many MLB players had used or currently were using PEDs. So if I ask you on the quiz, you know, what's the Mitchell Report? It was an investigation into MLB players using using, previously using or currently using PEDs. Fair enough. Right. And what the Mitchell report came out was that the use of PEDs was rampant within it, within MLB. Um, a lot of players were using it, right? Uh, name, names like you couldn't believe. Andy Pettit, uh, Roger Clemens, uh, Sammy Sosa, McGuire, everybody. Uh, everybody was using PEDs. And MLB didn't do anything about it. MLB was slow in response. They, eh, it's helping our business, you know, what do we care? So the conclusion, it came out that, you know, there was widespread PEB, PEB, PED, excuse me. Um, the MLB knew about it. They really didn't do anything about it. But then it, sh what the report indicated was that it threatened the integrity of the game. And this is where people jumped on it, right? It's threatening the integrity of the game, right? Fans may be alienated. All right, so since fans may be alienated, it's threatening the integrity of the game, maybe we need to do something about it. And, you know, around this time, 2003, 2004, the MLB owners and the MLB Players Associations got together and started hashing out a joint drug agreement, which I always found to be an interesting name, joint drug agreement, but that's just me. Um, a joint drug agreement where they both could live with with um, certain recommendations and certain protocols and policies putting, being put in place. Um, and that's kind of like what we have now, right? Most of the major sports properties in the U.S. have various drug agreements that are collectively bargained between the owners and the players through the players' union. And both parties have to agree to what those terms are, what the banned substance lists are, what the punishments are for violations, all that stuff. And then both parties will agree. As opposed to the World Anti-Doping Code, which is unilaterally put in uh, from the, through the governing bodies and the players don't have any, any um, input into what, the, into, what the, um, into what the policies are, the procedures are, the punishments are. All right, so the Mitchell Report, interestingly enough, came back and said, you know, it's, it's you know, players are using, MLB doesn't care, it's maybe threatening the error threatening or alienating fans, but the Mitchell Report recommended that no disciplinary measures be taken against any player so you, who use PEDs, which made sense, right? And everybody's up in arms. Oh, my God, how could you do it, spend all this money, do this whole report, find, you know, hundreds, you know, numbers of players using PEDs? Well, you couldn't do anything because during the time of the investigation, there were, were no rules in Major League Baseball against using banned substances. So how could you punish somebody for you 
doing something that wasn't at that time a violation of the rules. All right. Um, and let's switch gears a little bit, talk about uh, ethics of drug testing in amateur sports. You know, with college scholarships at stake, high school athletes are under a lot of pressure to perform. I mean, they just are, right? Are we putting too much pressure on student, student high school students? You know, are we pushing them towards the use of PEDs by setting so much pressure and saying, you know, you need to get to college, you need to get that scholarship, you need to, you know, do this that you may want to take in, in, in ingesting your body performance enhancers, right? There's a pressure to, pressure to perform, which equals the use of PEDs at the high school level. So you as sports executives really need to think about this, you know, especially if you're working in colleges or in high schools. You know, you really need to monitor. You know, are we putting too? Are you putting too much pressure on your high school students? If you are, well, you need to do something about it. You know, you maybe alleviate that pressure. Um, counsel the student athletes. You know, um, counsel them on the use of performance enhancers because, you know, an adult using a performance enhancer is a different thing than a young high school student using a performance enhancer. That adult can assume whatever risk. The 16, 17 year old really can't. Legally, they can't. And also their bodies are growing and developing, so it may have different effects, uh, long-term effects. So you as a sports executive really need to think about that, especially if you're working at the high school level or at that college level. Um, you know, you need to think about what procedures should be implemented, what students should be tested, how often they should be tested, if it's legal to test them, um, if it's even necessary at the high school level. I mean, your high school, maybe, you know, maybe not. You may look around and say, you know, you know, it doesn't seem like there's a problem here. Um, you know, are you going to do, if you're going to test everybody, does that mean all the teams? Does that mean the test chest team? Well, maybe. I mean, they may be using some form of stimulant. I don't know. Um, you know, other extracurricular activities? Again, are you going to test for recreational drugs or just PEDs? Do you have the right to test for recreational drugs? Interesting question. All right, and then, you know, what's going to happen if, you know, one of your players is using PEDs, are you going to think about having them criminally investigated? As a sports executive, you really need to think through a lot of these, a lot of these things. Um, the NCAA, different level, they, um, they have a drug testing um, program within, if you, within the NCAA. You know, it's applicable to all NCAA athletes. It's a strict liability program. All right, this is interesting. It's a strict liability program, which means that if the substance is in your body, no matter how it got there, doesn't matter. You violated the NCAA rules and you are subject to a one year suspension. Okay, even if, you know, the label didn't list the banned substance, even if you had it cleared by the um, uh, team doctor and the doctor screwed up and said it's okay. Um, even if you thought you had a therapeutic use exemption, but you, your therapeutic, therapeutic use exemption expired, it, even if, you know, you drank from somebody else's, um, water bottle and they had, um, performance enhancers in there and you had no idea it was in there, right? doesn't matter. It's in your body. You are automatically suspended for one year. It's a strict liability for that. That'll be a question on the final, on the, on the quiz. Um, you know, the interesting thing, and I want you guys to really go to the to the website, the NCAA website that I put up, and I have a question for you. Uh, what are the banned substances at the NCAA? Right? Look at the, look at the website. I want you, you know, I'm going to ask you that uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the quiz that's coming up at the end of the week. And I want you to list, what are the banned substances? How does the NCAA define what their banned substances are? So go to the website, check it out, um, and let me know what you think. All right, because it's going to be, you're going to have to let me know what you think. Cause it's going to be a question on the um, on the quiz. All right, so just a brief overview of um, the ethics of drug drug use and drug testing in the United States. I know we have a lot more to talk about when we meet on, on Friday. But so think of your questions, write them down, and we'll discuss them during the Zoom class on Friday. All right, um, again, I thank you for your time. I thank you for, for logging on and checking out this video. And as always, Zachary the Book. All right, take care.